If you're worried by zombies, don't look at that picture. It's a deliberately provocative picture because it's a deliberately provocative passage. Uh, there are moments in the drama of the Gospel accounts where Jesus seems to choose very odd ways of expressing himself. Uh, I think he is actually trying to be provocative and upsetting. He wants to upset the assumptions of the people who he is addressing. He does not want them to be able to simply fit them into their already established ideas and ways of seeing things and doing things. He wants to trouble our deepest held shared convictions. And I think this saying about being the bread of life and indicating that we are to eat his flesh and drink his blood is one such example of that. Is Jesus unique or just one of us? Why is Donald Trump on the screen? Jesus makes some audacious claims here. Now, up until recently, the wisdom was if you wanted to be taken seriously, you didn't make audacious claims that you couldn't back up. Now, that's shifted a little bit in our consciousness in the last couple of years. But Jesus makes two very audacious claims here. He says that he is the bread of life, and he says that he came down from heaven. And these two claims are pretty audacious. Of course, the second claim about where he came from, if that were true, then the first claim might be easier to accept. Because if he came down from heaven, if he's sent from God, then you pretty much got to back him on whatever he says. So it's interesting about that too. Um, when somebody comes from somewhere, they represent that place. Well, again, all the categories that I use have to be, you have to have caveats now because some people are breaking the categories, but it used to be that a country's leader would speak and they would speak on behalf of that nation. So when Malcolm Turnbull, our Prime Minister, gets up and says stuff about Australia, he speaks on our behalf. He comes from Australia, he speaks for Australia, he has the authority of Australia. If Jesus came down from heaven, he has the imprimatur of heaven. He speaks as one with heaven's authority. And so that's why the Jews immediately pick up on that where is he from question rather than he's the bread of life question. They go, hang on a minute. We know exactly where you're from. We know your parents. We watched you as a little boy. We saw you grow up in and around our place. You took that thing off my clothesline that time and you knocked over the pot plant and we sold you stuff in the market. We watched your dad build things. The idea here, of course, is that Jesus couldn't possibly be from heaven because he's from Mary and Joseph. We know where he's from. He's from Nazareth. We know that he is simply one of us, isn't he? Can Jesus be both man and God? I have a lot of sympathy for the way the Jews saw this because it wouldn't have been as easy for them to understand Jesus' divine identity. I mean, it's hard enough for those of us looking back on history to accept who Jesus might be. But if you saw Jesus walking around and doing normal stuff, I think it would be a really difficult thing to believe that he was from heaven. It's not like he was doing his magic tricks every other day. And again, we get a slightly distorted view of this because the gospel accounts really tell the story in the main of three years of Jesus' life when he's about 30 years old. So there's been a lot of life that's gone on where he's just gone under the radar. He's just like everybody else in the community or, or close enough to to not be overly noticed. And then in the course of three years, a bunch of really remarkable events take place. But it's three years and it's in different places and there is no live feed or social media to keep track of it all. If you're not actually there in the place, you might hear about it down through the grapevine. The, the social media back then was known as gossip. We still have that too. But 
had lots of fake news in it as well. And so you couldn't really be sure what was true and what wasn't true. It's understandable that the Jews balked at the idea that Jesus had come down from heaven. They were really only the stories that people told and later wrote down. And so Jesus says, don't grumble about it. You'll either see this or you won't see it. It depends on the way you see. It's not a straightforward thing to see Jesus as anything other than the neighbour that you've known all your life. There's nothing that would make it undeniably conclusive that he was something special. See, what you see is actually determined by what you're looking for. And we make meaning from that which we're prone to notice and to understand as important. Two people looking at the exact same details will see different things. Particular parts of the scene or the narrative will speak to them in particular ways and the same parts will mean different things to different other people depending on how a person sees and hears. And Jesus highlights that there's no point grumbling. Don't argue about it. You'll either see it or you won't. And it's just not, not simply just what you see, it's the way you understand. Um, when I first arrived in Manly, my previous placement many, many years ago, and we did a big effort to try and reach out to some younger people. And a group, I got a group together and we put on some Saturday evening, what we called alternative worship events. And uh, one Saturday evening, we had a, a roll of butcher's paper about three feet wide and I put it around the edges of the church and I painted like two foot high letters, the lyrics of a song about the kingdom being upside down, the, um, the hungry are fed and the, the poor are blessed or something. I can't remember the words now, but the, it looked really good. And everybody in the youth group, the younger people said, oh, this is great. We shouldn't take it down. It should, it should be here. And I thought, oh, okay. So I left it up for Sunday worship and I was, had a congregation up the road and then the one at Manly. And by the time I got to the one in Manly, which was a small group of elderly women, they were huddled at the door of the church going <laughs> and uh, I came in the back way and saw them up there and I thought that's odd they're usually sitting down by now and went up and they were really very very upset like the most upset I'd seen this very gracious group of people and they were spitting chips who had desecrated their worship space how dare they and what is this and what's going on and I, I got a bit trembly and as I listened to them I thought oh dear I'm in a lot of trouble now <laughs> and I realised they thought that somebody else had done it and I thought well I'd better confess straight away and I said oh uh, well what you probably should understand is that I did this I, I, I painted the letters it, it's my work and they went oh 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 and suddenly their tune really changed. And it astonished me. It really actually rocked my boat quite deeply. I thought, wow, that's really weird. And they started, oh, oh, were you, um, were you reaching out to the young people? You know, oh, yeah, you know, let's explain what we're doing. Oh, well, yeah, no, that makes, oh, no, no. It's amazing how what we see can change and the meaning of it can change on a dime depending on what we associate it with. And generally speaking, that's a work that we can't do for each other or even for ourselves. For the kind of monumental shift that Jesus is talking about, that's the work of the Holy Spirit. It's a shift away from our unconscious biases, those things that we don't even know we hold. We, could, we can't critique them because they just, they form the operating system of everything we see. They, they happen behind our consciousness, as it were. And the Holy Spirit's work is to transform us at that depth. I don't think it's humanly possible for us to do it for ourselves or for anybody else, only the Spirit, using circumstances and relationships and world events perhaps, but the Spirit is the one who transforms the way we see and what we see and how we understand those events. Somehow in this transformation to, be, to see more like Jesus, we encounter eternal life.
a new way of doing life that is eternally good. Now, eternal life is a funny thing. It, um, it has this notion of going on forever, but it's kind of outside of time. And some things we do seem like a good idea at the time. Luckily, it didn't get painted like that. Um, you know, sometimes we do stuff that seems, at the moment, the best that we can do. When I was in New Zealand studying many years ago, we did a beautiful walk hiking around like Waikiri Moana. It, uh, it was a four-day walk and they have huts and you stay. But where we started, what, there was a little stream we had to walk across. It was 30 feet wide or something and only came up to about just below the knee. I had all our hiking boots on. It was freezing cold, like almost snowy cold, like most of New Zealand is at times. And, um, and the experienced hikers all started to take their boots off. And I looked at them and went, you're walking through there in bare feet and there's like stones and all sorts of stuff and it's freezing cold. And I thought, I'm not taking my boots off. And there was a few of us who were stubborn and thought, and like their boots that went up quite high and took a lot of effort to take them off. And so the experienced ones rolled up their pants, took off their shoes, walked through, got to the other side, dried off, put on the boots and us fools, went right, in we go, you get a few steps in and suddenly the water comes in around your socks and soaks your boots and it's cold and it's freezing, you get out the other side and they weigh a ton, the water's falling out of the little holes. And sometimes it seems like a good idea at the time, but for the four day hike I had wet boots. Who knew? <laughs> and walking around with wet socks and wet boots, I f had the most amazing blisters. It can see a good, seem like a good idea at, a t at the time, but duration of time helps us understand the value of ideas. After a period of time, we get a bit of hindsight. You know that idea, 2020 hindsight? The value of something becomes really clear when we can see the implications of it, when we can see where it goes and what it means and how it affects people and all those sorts of things. When Jesus allowed himself to be crucified, the gospel narrative makes clear that the disciples didn't know how to make sense of those events. They were terrified. In fact, they all denied Jesus they were so terrified. They completely lost any plot that they thought they were in. They ran off and hid, expecting that the Romans would do to them what they had just done to Jesus because they were associated with Jesus. It was a very reasonable expectation at that level. As time passed, they reflected on all that Jesus had taught and performed and represented and then the Holy Spirit came and broke open their assumptions and allowed them to see all of that in a new way. The fearful disciples became a transformed band of preachers and teachers and miracle workers and social transformers that have changed the world forever. They started to see the eternal value and not just the short-term thing. See, Jesus saying about eating his flesh and drinking his blood is not simply an interesting bit of teaching although he did lots of interesting teaching. And it's not simply uh, a prelude to some extraordinary healing, although he did lots of extraordinary healing that was very liberating for people. This is about the deepest possible digestion of all that Jesus is and all that he showed us. When we eat food, it becomes part of us, doesn't it? A couple of years ago, there was a, a documentary by Morgan Spurlock called Supersize Me. Did anyone see that? For 30 days, this guy ate nothing but McDonald's. And it was at a time when the, they had a promotion about supersizing and he made a little pact in his head. If the cashier says, would you like to supersize that, which means get the biggest possible version, like unbelievably big, every time he would say yes. So he would go and make his order. If they said, would you like to supersize that? He'd say yes and he'd eat it all. And after 30 days, this healthy young man became almost morbidly obese. It changed his moods and his energy levels and what he was 
capable of doing. You see, what we eat transforms us. It becomes part of us. And Jesus is saying, eat me. Let me transform you at the deepest possible level so that you are no longer the same as you were before. And it should trouble us. It should disturb us. It should make us see in relative terms who we are now and go, that's not where we're going to stay. We should be scandalised by Jesus' words. Scandalised to the point where we cannot simply synthesise them with our established ways of thinking and seeing and being. They are meant to challenge us to reconsider the way we see and do everything. When Jesus says, I'm the bread of life, he's indicating that he is the sustenance for life. Not short-term life, not like the meal you're going to have at lunchtime that will give you energy for your body to go for the next day or so. The stuff that he's talking about is good for all eternity. It's always been good. It is good now. It will be good forever. And you do not miss out when you invest yourself in those things. It's not a short-term fix for bodily hunger. It's an eternal way of seeing and engaging everything. Jesus calls us to so profoundly ingest all that he modelled and taught and showed us, his way of seeing and acting and even desiring that we are transformed by him. This is why we spend time reminding ourselves of these stories and we live around these stories this is why we immerse ourselves in this alternative way of seeing that is contained in the scriptures. This is why we gather. This is why we worship, to be transformed. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you didn't want to simply be another commentator on life but you want to transform our very life, change us from the deepest places out. And we thank you that you send your spirit to do that work as we gather around these stories and remind ourselves and encourage one another, you do shift us in those deepest places, that we might engage this world as your hands and your feet, as people who love as you love, and so bring glory to your name. Amen.